Well, I want to invite Rick Zook to come on. And uh, I, uh, I told Rick we do two services here, and he's had to, he, he was kind enough to kind of abbreviate uh, his message for us because we do two services, and so now you're going to run over. Now what are you going to do? Talk real fast. No. So I, let, let me just tell you how we function here at Cornerstone of Augusta. Pretty much like any other Cornerstone? Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> we believe in ketchup. Yeah, I like ketchup. That's like ketchup? Son, that's my son's favorite dish, yeah. Right. Well, the reason we believe in ketchup, because if anybody has anything on the crock pot that's going to burn, ketchup covers a multitude of sin. There you go. All right. So the next crew's coming in at 11, so have at it. All right. All right. We'll, we'll welcome them in, won't we? Is anybody in a hurry this morning? Okay, good. Don't you love when your pastor asks that publicly? Does anybody ever say yes? <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> All right. Would you welcome? Would you welcome Rick? Thank you, brother. Um, I think I do. I don't know. Can y'all hear me? The mic's on then. All right. Well, we are Rick and Angie Zook, and uh, our daughter Kira is 14. Our son Keen is 12. We do not have them here this morning. They're with their grandparents, and they're actually going to Broadway for a change. I think the first time since July. So. They wanted that opportunity. We gave that to them. As Pastor Greg mentioned, we are supported by your faith promise giving. Uh, in part, by that, a portion comes to us, and we thank you for that. It allows us to do what we are doing. And this morning, we want to share what the Lord has been doing, where we are, and in that way, be accountable to you for the gifts that you all have given to us. I do want to mention before I forget, we have a uh, new prayer card back there in the back on the table. Please take one. Angie and I may not have changed much, but the kids, of course, do grow and change. There are also some DVDs there. If you uh, know about the Etow story, I'll be mentioning that this morning. They are back there for sale. That's the only thing on the table for sale. But we would ask also that you sign up on the uh, clipboard back there for our newsletter if you are interested in we do ask for a snail mail address because I have Amish relatives, and so we do still send out our newsletter, snail mail. So if you would uh, be interested in learning more and keeping up to date with what's going on there in Papua New Guinea with us, please do sign up for that this morning. For all of the, uh, those of you that don't know us, I grew up in various places around the U.S., and then I spent my teen years in Papua New Guinea, or PNG, as you may hear it shortened to. Uh, I was 14 when my parents went over to PNG with New Tribe's mission, and we moved into the Moat Tribe, which is a language group in the interior of western New Britain Island. I spent my high school years there uh, among the Moat, and I learned the Moat language. Now, Angie was blessed to grow up in a Christian family up in Broadway. She's been a part of Cornerstone as long as there has been a Cornerstone, and we met in college and then were married the year after we graduated. Well, fast forward until the year uh, 2001, we entered training with New Tribes Mission, or NTM as we often shorten it to. During this time, God began to give us a vision uh, for how we were going to do uh, the work, the tribal mission work we were going to do. Instead of just going and evangelizing one tribe, the Lord was laying a multiplication vision upon our hearts. We thought we would plant a church among one language group, and then as those believers matured, reach out into a neighboring language group alongside of them as missionaries. Little do we know that God was going to use this vision, but in a way that we had not even uh, thought of or planned on. So after two and a half years of training, we went to Papua New Guinea in August of 2004. Well, now where is PNG, you may be asking yourselves. The island of New Guinea is the second is largest island in the world, located just north of Australia. The eastern half is the independent nation of Papua New Guinea, and it has hundreds of inhabited islands that people live on, including the mainland. The western half of the island is under the control of the Indonesian government. Now, as to landmass, Papua New Guinea is a roughly equivalent to the state of California. As for population, roughly equivalent to greater Atlanta, somewhere in that six to seven million uh, population uh, amount. One other thing you need to know about Papua New Guinea is within the country, there are 800, possibly as many as 1,000 different languages being smoke, spoken among those people. So in a landmass the size of California with a population of greater Atlanta, you have 800 to 1,000 different languages being spoken. You all down here in Augusta County would not be speaking the same language that we speak up in Broadway. Okay, does that make sense? Off the co north coast of Papua New Guinea, 
about four degrees south of the equator lies the 14th li largest island in the world, the island of New Britain. On the western half of that uh, is where we live. The island itself is about 250 miles long, an average of 50 miles wide. It is very volcanic in nature, and we have a lot of earthquakes because there's like five tectonic plates that come together uh, around our island. We live and work on the western end among the Lucy people uh, group, but we're going to talk about that a little bit more in a minute. Now, when we arrived in PNG in 2004, we spent some time in national culture and language study, and what we didn't know was that God had been, pre been preparing something in line with our vision, uh, preparing us to be working with the Moak people group that we didn't, uh, didn't even know existed. Well, let's flash back a minute, if you will, to 1986, December 3rd, 1986, when the gospel was presented for the first time among the Moak people group. Uh, if you have seen the Etau videos, you've seen a presentation of what happened that day. Everyone in the village believed, uh, from the smallest child up through the oldest adult. Over the ensuing years, the Moak believers themselves have carried the gospel to every village in the Moak language group. Um, Dad wrote Bible lessons that were not only for evangelism, but also for discipleship, and the believers themselves would continue to use those for teaching and outreach, as well as for feeding and growing uh, the believers. The discipleship and the evangelism continue to this day. Today, there are Moke believers and Bible teachers. They've reached out through the entire Moke tribe. There are more than 24 churches. There's 18 churches that are large enough to have ordained elders among them, uh, as well as ordained deacons. Now, one of these Moke elders, uh, a man by the name of Patrick Cock, who's he looked out across the northern border of the Moke language territory, and across those cultural borders, he saw another language group, the Lucy, who were in need of the gospel. They lived in darkness and the bondage of, of sin, and they needed a missionary. And so he began to learn the Lucy language. He moved to the Lucy territory along with his family, and he began to teach a uh, Lucy couple he started writing Lucy Bible lessons, translating the Bible lessons into Lucy, and he taught that first couple through to the uh, head of the talk, the gospel presentation, and they became believers. What Patrick realized as he was doing this is while he was fully capable of evangelizing, translating the Bible lessons, doing uh, all the other work, what he was not trained to do, what he was not equipped to do, was to do the linguistic work and to do Bible translation. He didn't have the tools or the training to do those things. Once he realized this, he went back to the plurality of Moak elders in one of their meetings, and he presented this need. He said, we need outside help. And so the elders met together, they prayed about it, and what they realized is they needed to approach new tribes to ask for a Western missionary to help them with the translation work. They made that request to the new tribe's liaison next time he was in there, and the new tribe's liaison came back to the Hoskins Center, where we just happened to be studying national language and culture, and he presented that to the group of missionaries there. Well, now that seemed like an ideal fit, because, hey, I already spoke the Moke language. But we didn't want to just do that, because that was the thing to do. We prayed about it, and we ended up joining the Moke outreach to the Lucy people. God, in his grace, allowed us to partner with an already mature church that was reaching out into another language group. They were learning to support their own missionaries, and he allowed us to join that group. He allowed us to leapfrog ahead maybe 10, 12 years in our vision, which is a really great thing. So back in 2006, we moved into the Lucy uh, territory. After house wedding, we got down to learning Lucy language and culture, uh, along with our Moke co-workers. Now, we are the only Westerners there in the work. Our co-workers are all PNG citizens who are Moke missionaries. Because after we joined the work, the Moke elders met again and appointed Kamias and Moni to join the work uh, along with their families. And so there were four of us uh, our first term in the work. Now, there's something else you really need to know about the Lucy people. Uh, that is that they are animus. That means that they believe that they can manipulate and or appease the spirits that they believe exist in the world around them. Uh, and that way they will get the outcomes that they desire. But they also live in great fear of these spirits. For example, a Lucy person uh, would um, never go to certain places because they believe that spirits live there and they're afraid of what those spirits might do to them if they were to go there. They also have a lot of rituals to influence outcomes. For example, when a Lucy man goes out to fish, he will pound the side of the boat or the canoe and splash water back to the village so that all the bad stays back in the village and doesn't go with him going fishing. But the Lucy are also considered neo-animists. That is, in addition to their traditional animistic practices, they've layered on top a false Western religion, a religion of works, a religion of do's and don'ts. And so they're in a double bondage uh, to this religious system that they try and follow, as well as their animism, and they don't even realize it. Uh, and we knew that it was only by the grace of God and the truth of his word 
that they were going to come out from under this double bondage and be able to become believers in uh, what Christ has done for them. So this morning I want to tell you a little bit more about what we've been doing this past term on the field, how God works in his time and in his way to accomplish his purposes, uh, how God uses the weak and the despised of this world, and he's using them to break the bonds, uh, the bondage that are on the lives of the Lucy people. I uh, also want to talk a little bit about Bible translation this morning oh, and a couple other projects we've been involved in over the last four years, and as well as how the Lord is using the Moak Church to reach out into three different language groups. Now, our second full term on the field uh, found us really getting going on what is one of our main jobs, that is the job of Bible translation. So we're going to talk a few minutes about that, how we translate the Bible from English into the Lucy language. Angie and I usually work on a chunk of about 100 verses at a time, and it takes each of us three weeks to work through uh, those 100 verses. That is three weeks for Angie because she's the main translator, and then three weeks for me. So we're going to need some help this morning. We're going to very rapidly go through 12 easy steps for Bible translation. If I can get my assistant to come and help me, we might actually get this done in under the time limit and have you out here in time for lunch. <laughs> <clears throat> so we need somebody to stand in for Angie right off the bat. Now, guys, you don't have to translate. You don't have to sing and dance. You don't even, if you're Angie, you don't even have to hold your own cards. You just have to have put on a T-shirt and hold a card. So, Sherry, thank you for volunteering. You're coming on up here. You're standing in for Angie this morning because I didn't even bring the right. Can somebody bring that that tripod and send it right here? Well, that's good. Then all you have to all you have to do is stand there and look beautiful. Yes, ma'am. They're going to get you an easel right off real soon. Yes, ma'am. I know it's going to mess up your hair. I'm sorry. It's just the way it is. But you remember, you're living in the jungle and nobody cares how you look. So it's all good. Okay, so. This hundred verse, hundred chunks of hundred verses at a time about what we work in. Hundred, hundred and twenty. Why? Well, that's all we can handle in one week as we go through these jobs. First week, Angie sits down with the text. She says, "Okay, here we got these hundred verses. What does it mean?" She does exegeting. She looks at the verses. She says, "What is the meaning of these words? How am I going to put it into Lucy?" Okay, simple enough. She makes a rough draft. That's the first week she spends with the text. All right, simple enough, right? Next week. Uh, after she's created this exegetical draft, she sits down. You have the next volunteer? Okay. The next week on Monday, she sits down with a Lucy speaker, okay? And on Monday, she will take a chunk of 20 to 25 verses. Why 20 to 25? Well, um, let me tell you from experience, after that, your brain turns to oatmeal and you get no productivity, okay? <laughs> sits down with a Lucy speaker. They go over the rough draft. Basically, what they're doing is trying to get Angie's Englishisms out. They're looking for some key terms, ways of saying things, thank you, and how to better say it. And from that, they do a mother tongue rough draft. The next day, on Tuesday, they come back again. Those verses they were. I'm second guessing who I picked for main translator here. (coughs) Yes, I did. So. The next day they sit down, they take those 20, 25 verses. What do they do with them? Angie reads them, they speak those verses. The, the Lucy speaker will tell her back what Angie said. Now what this does is, you may, working in a paragraph at a time, you can't tell me back exactly what I said in that whole word for word for that whole paragraph. Okay? But what you can do is you can give me the main ideas back in your own words. That's what we're looking. We're looking for the flow of the Lucy language as it comes back. And it's being tape recorded or on MP3 or whatever. So that's called mother tongue taping. They then work on the next 20 verses for the next day. So that second, so there's, yeah. <coughs> that second, uh, they get that second group ready. They work through, that's Angie's second week. Now the other thing that's happening is later that day she takes that um, MP3 file, she prints out a hard copy of the text and she hands it to one of our coworkers who will then listen to that and type it. We have taught our coworkers to type, and so they will type that transcription for us. Okay, the third week then, this is Angie's longest week, she will take the transcription, she will be listening to it, she'll be looking at the typing, she will come up with a, well, this is a long week, you just want to wait. This is a very long week. <laughs> the revised mother tongue draft, okay? Now, do you have a, somebody for me? Oh, I'll give it to Pastor Greg. I mean, it's a good model because, you know, it is you and me and him and her and, yeah. Okay. You get to go. Now, remember, Angie has just spent three weeks pouring her, I don't know, hopefully not too much blood or tears, but certainly sweat into this 100 or 120 verses, okay? 
Think she's a little bit attached? Think she's a little bit invested in it? Yes, she is. She hands it to me, okay? I sit down, and in a couple hours, I do a content check. What's the content check? Well, I have the Lucy over here. I have the English, essentially literal version, like the NASB or the ESV over here, and I will be comparing, making sure nothing's been left out, nothing's been added, uh, and I'll have a few gram radical or, or suggestions I might want to make. I'm doing a content check. After that, go ahead, Sherry, you can turn it now. <laughs> we sit down. We go over those corrections, suggestions, additions, deletions, and revisions, at which point we then have marital counseling. <laughs> Guys, Bible translators hold, have very strong convictions, and this Bible translation can tear a team apart, and it's probably right in this step. Pray for us because this is where we work things out, and it uh, is probably one of the harder things we do. So that's my first week with the text. Remember, at this point, Angie is going back, and she's working with the next cycle of 100 or 120 verses. Now, my second week with the text. I have three new Lucy speakers that haven't worked with the text yet. They come up. Okay? I sit down with them, each individually, okay, and read through 20 to 25 verses at a time. Why? Well, by the time I get to about 30 verses, of brain is oatmeal, no, no return. It's just not worth it, okay? So four or five days that week, I will sit down individually with these three people. I will read through it once, give them a big picture of what we're talking about in those 20, 25 verses, come back, read them a paragraph. They will tell me back. If they get all the points, hey, they are comprehending it. If they can't get it or they, everybody leaves one thing out, we know that something isn't communicating. We need to work on revising things. So that is my second week with the text. Now, we have another little step in here that once Angie and I have revised, come back and done some revisions, we've come up with a third. Uh, Sherry, Sherry, <laughs> stop Facebooking your friends and <laughs> we're going to. Or whatever y'all do over here, these texts and things. I don't know. <laughs> in the spotlight. So we create a third draft, okay? And at that point, we give it to one of our coworkers. He's the original coworker, and he's like our final proofreader, editor, checker. Comes back. We add all those things in. We have those corrections added. I think, Sherry, you can uh, flip as well to make corrections. Yeah, there you go. You've made corrections. Very good. Thank you. You give it to me. My third week of the text, I do a back to English translation, or BTE, okay? What is that? We need another English translation? No, we've got like 365 of them. We really don't need another one. There's a couple reasons for this. One is to catch any errors. Sometimes, I, you know, I catch a few errors that have made it even this far into the thing. Second of all, it is a footprint of what we've done. So we have uh, records. People can, people can come and say, hey, how did they do in Lucy? How did they handle this key term? How did they handle this difficult text? They can look. But the third thing, the big reason is, is because we're going to have Dennis come up here. He's going to be our language, our, our translation consultant. He is going to look at that. He, that is how he is going to advise and check the text because he doesn't speak Lucy. So after I've done the BTE and I have checked it, I give it to Angie. She sends it off. You want to go ahead and flip? There you go. She does a spell check, the final spell check. And then you want to flip again, please? Thank you. You send it off to the translation consultant, and he looks over it. He has some questions to ask Angie before he comes and does an on-site check. He evaluates the, tra the translation, sends Angie the questions. Angie processes those questions, and then it becomes th the big event, the on-site check. Please come up, sir. We're going to do Yeah, go ahead. You can flip it. Flip one. There you go. On-site check. This is the big deal, guys. The translation consultant, who has already done the translation in his own language, comes and helps on-site doing this. Now, how does he help? Well, he has in front of him the BTE, the Back to English Translation that I've done. He speaks the trade language. Angie will read a paragraph in Lucy, or a verse, depending on how difficult the text is. As you can see, a new Lucy speaker that hasn't worked with this text before, right? None of this yet they've worked with. He will hear in Lucy what Angie said. He will, in his mind, translate it into the trade language, Melanesian Pigeon, and tell Dennis, our translation consultant, what he has heard. At that point, Dennis looks and translates in his head from, from Melanesian Pigeon into English, looks and sees on the paper, is that right? Has it communicated? Has it come around the circle? Every verse of Scripture gets checked this way. Okay? On a good day, doing narrative, they can do 250 verses. Okay? We have not checked epistles yet. We're not sure how fast it will go. It will probably go much slower at that point. Okay, after that, there's some corrections and additions that Angie might need to make in the text. She will also hand Sherry a card that says making corrections to the BTE, at which point it comes to me. I can format and print it, and we get it into the hands of the Lucy people. So there you go. 
Whoops, sorry. Yeah, I'll give you one, too, because you're writing Bible lessons. <laughs> and so this is the ultimate goal of what we're doing is to get the translated scriptures into the hands of the Lucy people so that they have the word of, the God, word of God in their own hands, in their own mother tongue, heart language, just like you and I do. All right, let's have a hand for all the volunteers. If I could have somebody just move the <laughs> things to the side. Put your T-shirts wherever. We'll deal with them after. Okay, gang. That's how you do Bible translation in 12 easy steps. <laughs> so, again, thanks to our volunteers. But, yeah, the ultimate goal is to get the scriptures translated, printed, formatted, and put into the hands of the Lucy people so that they have the word of God in their heart language, just like you and I do. Allow me to update you uh, on what the Lord has allowed us to accomplish as far as Bible translation this past term into the Lucy language. Remember, what we are translating is determined by what is needed for the discipleship and teaching uh, aspects of the work. In 2011, we started our translation project with the story of Joseph, which is basically most of Genesis 37 through uh, chapter 50. We uh, start there because it's mostly dialogue and narrative, and uh, it's, it's pretty easy to do. The, the verses are used, but they're not key verses, and so it's a good place to cut your teeth. From there on out, what is uh, translated is determined by the chronological teaching program. Phase one of the chronological teaching program starts in Genesis and goes from creation to Christ. Uh, it teaches an unbeliever who God is, what sin is, um, and why we need a Savior. Basically, it teaches them about the Bible from creation to Christ. Phase two looks at those same passages from the perspective of a believer. And so while our coworkers are writing those Bible lessons, we translated the scriptures that were needed from Genesis, Exodus, Judges, Jonah, uh, Numbers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and a few other Old Testament passages, particularly those that dealt with Messianic prophecy. Now the third phase of the chronological teaching program is Acts, and so that is where we headed in a 2013 calendar year. We did the complete book of Acts. Please praise God with us that everything that I've mentioned so far, all the scriptures that you've seen on the screen, have been through the whole process and have been consultant checked and are into the hands of the Lucy believers as well as our coworkers. Now in the 2014 calendar year, we focused on the complete book of Romans because that's where the teaching program heads next. We also completed the book of Genesis, worked on the book of Ruth, and added a few more Psalms. All this material has been done up to the point of BTEing. I'm a year behind in my work because of a number of other things that came up. So, uh, we have seven Psalms translated. You say, why is that important? Well, we believe that the whole of the Word of God is Scripture and that everybody deserves it in their language. And Lord willing, and health holds out, we hope someday to have the complete Bible translated for the Lucy people in the Lucy language. Now, if you're a math person, percentages will speak to you. Oh, yeah, let me, let me mention that we do have the complete book of Genesis, Ruth, Jonah, Acts, and Romans translated, as well as large chunks of Exodus and Mark. Math person... Percentage to speak to you, 23 and a quarter percent of the New Testament, uh, 9 and a quarter percent of the Old Testament, almost 13 percent of the whole Bible has been through the whole process and has been consultant checked. If you can include everything that's been translated but not consultant checked yet, we have uh, 30 percent of the New Testament, 11 and a half of the Old Testament, well over 16 percent of the whole Bible has been translated. So please praise God with us for his help and enabling to come this far in this huge project. Well, while we've been doing Bible translation, our Moat coworkers have been busy uh, building relationships, doing pre-evangelism, and taking the Moat Bible lessons and translating them into Lucy so that they can do the uh, evangelism and discipleship with them. Once they have written a Bible lesson uh, and they type it up on a computer, I sit down, I go over it, do any revisions, formatting, and editing that's needed. Now, in the summer of 2013, uh, the first team outreach began with our Moat coworkers to the Lucy uh, people for the first time completely in the Lucy language. They taught using the chronological Bible lessons uh, in phase one from creation to Christ. Uh, it was taught completely in the Lucy language for the first time ever. It takes several months to do this kind of teaching from creation to Christ. It's a lot of work, but we were really, really excited about it. When we reached the head of the talk, or that is the gospel presentation, there was a group of Moak villagers who came over and performed uh, for us the Last Supper, Christ's betrayal, the trials, crucifixion, death, burial, resurrection, and ascension, all in Lucy for those who had been hearing the teaching. All the Lucy that had been being taught that day professed faith in Christ, what Christ had done for them, his shed blood and death on the cross. 
Augustine, one of the new believers, says, hey, my family needs to hear this. Well, yes, they do. And so his family, his extended family, was the next group of people to be he uh, hear the teaching in 2014. Um, this time, uh, almost all the people that had been hearing uh, Augustine's extended family, they became believers, including uh, Augustine's elderly father. Um, his name is Antone, and he is the patriarch of the group. But remember what I said about, thank you, thanks. Uh, remember what I said about how God is in control uh, at the timing of events? Only about two weeks after he heard the gospel, Antone passed away and went home to be with his new Lord and Savior. Isn't that incredible? We believe it was. Well, after they were became believers, Augustine's family said, hey, our kids need to hear this. We said, yeah, that's what we were telling you from the beginning, but because they were under the pretext of this false Western religion, it wasn't something that kids did, and so they didn't listen to us until it was too late. So this year, while we've been gone, one of at least two groups of people being taught was Augustine's uh, that, that extended family, their kids and some other relatives who hadn't been in on, on that. So please pray for our coworkers as they continue to teach and disciple, uh, even while we're here at home. The job's not an easy one. There has been persecution uh, for them. There's been persecution for the new believers as well. So keep them in your prayers. Early in our second full term, we realized something, that we were going to need more manpower on our team. Uh, as we got into teaching and curriculum development, and uh, especially uh, the evangelism, we were going to need uh, help in those things. And so by the recommendation of a veteran missionary, we approached the Moca local churches and asked for three more families to join our uh, Lucy team. Well, that was a great thing. They, they met and prayed and sent us three more missionaries. But the problem we soon realized was they didn't know Lucy, and we didn't have time to sit down and learn Lucy with them. See, the first time we learned the Lucy language, our coworkers sat with us, and we all learned it together. Not an ideal language learning situation, but that's what we did. And so they just mimicked us and did what we did, and that's how they learned Lucy. Now, there are literally stacks of things in English on how to learn another language. There's absolutely nothing in Melanesian Pidgin on how to learn another language in a culture. And so our moat coworkers needed something. Well, that began a project that has taken up all of our spare time, our Saturdays, uh, our hobby time, whatever, this last term. Thankfully, our, our children were able to step up and help out with a lot of the housework and cooking and so forth. Uh, we're very, very thankful that they're a part of our team. What we did is we began to take our English culture and language learning materials and translate them and adapt them and write things in Melanesian Pidgin for uh, our, moat, our moat coworkers. Now, the reason we did it in Pidgin rather than Moke is, well, and she doesn't speak Moke. And we couldn't do it in Lucy because they were trying to learn Lucy. So we went to a neutral language for that reason, but also because our hope is, is that down the road, other uh, national believers, mature churches, as they reach out, will be able to use these materials as well as they reach across their language and culture borders. At first, we just met with these new coworkers. Whenever we had new material ready, we said, hey, come in, we got some stuff. But we soon realized that we needed a goal to shoot for, and they needed things on a regular basis. So we started setting a date. See, you can learn a language casually through exposure to it, but you will never learn it at a ministry level unless you systematically go about it. And you certainly will never learn a culture to the level you need if you don't have a systematic approach to doing that. And uh, so if you just have at it, you're going to have gaps in your knowledge and you're not even going to realize it. We weren't too many months into this process, and one afternoon there was a knock at the back door. I went down, and it's not a metal door. That doesn't sound right. <coughs> and there was these three moke elders there. And uh, they said, hey, we believe the Lord is leading us to become missionaries to the unnamed people group, which is just to our west. And they said, um, the problem is we don't know how to learn a language and culture, but we hear you have this class. Well, what was I going to say? No, uh, hit the road, Jack. We're not accepting new members. I said, sure. And immediately our class size doubled from three to six. Well, it was about a month later. And again, one afternoon, there was a knock on the door, and I went down. Here was three more moke elders, and they said, uh, through circumstances in our lives, we, are, we believe the Lord is leading us to become missionaries to the Kobe people group, which lie both to our east and to our west and is a related language to the Lucy language group. And they said, um, we hear you have this class. What was I going to say? Nope, class is full, six is the total. I said, sure, you guys can join. And so they would hike from a day away. Uh, these, these nine students, and once a month we have these classes, language and culture learning classes for them. And um, over the, uh, when, we, when we wrapped up last year, there was 15 Moke missionary students in that class.
Well, this is what we've developed, and uh, not all these things, all these books are polished yet, but there's four levels of both language and culture learning, working from the simplest up to the most complicated. Um, they, uh, along with our coworkers, we've written some tests and checks, exams for each level of that to make sure they're ready to go on to the next check. Uh, we cover, cover practical steps from nouns and verbs on up through the story level of language, as well as from culture, things that you can point to, touch, taste, and see, on up through the abstract levels of worldview and culture. Along the way, we help them with things like how to use an MP3 player, glossary words that explain English terms they may be running across as they use things like computers and MP3 players and a lot of other aids, things like culture shock, because they face culture shock as well when they go cross-culturally. It's taken a lot of time and work to develop, but um, our prayers are that God will use this material to aid other PNG citizen missionaries as they reach out beyond their language and culture borders into still unreached people groups. Ultimately, this is the kind of resource that allows us as Western missionaries to multiply ourselves, the very vision God gave us as we were in training uh, a number of years ago. Well, in conclusion this morning, I just want to bring you up to date on what Moat missionaries are doing. Right now, there are 18 Moat missionary families reaching out at various stages of their ministry into three other language groups. This means they already have gone or are going cross-culturally into these language groups. There are six families reaching out among the Kobe people group. Uh, there's actually believers there, and they're going ongoing teaching, so they're trying like mad to learn the, the Kobe language so that they can minister to them in their heart language. But the people are so eager to hear that there's been some teaching in Pidgin as well. So it's a messy situation, but hey, that's where we're at, and that's what we're doing. But keep them in your prayers as they learn the language and culture, um, that there will be a high interest in the gospel and hearing about the true teaching of the Bible. Keep them in your prayers as well because they have been persecuted. Uh, one of the men you see behind me and one of the new believers, there's a small vocal opposition, and he took an opportunity to go and pay off a policeman to come into the village and cause problems. The policeman then loaded these guys into a boat, took them out to sea, beat the two men, threw them overboard, and said, swim to shore. Well, the one guy's a good swimmer, the other guy wasn't. They made it to a bit of a reef. They got in a canoe when a lady came along, and they made it back to shore. But God uh, is using what was meant for evil for good. Even though they were in within their legal rights to prosecute these guys, they chose not to. When the guy tried to get the police to do it again, the police said, no, I'm already under God's condemnation. I'm not going to do it. You do your own dirty work. And ultimately, the guy who was causing persecution, this has all happened since we're gone, so I'm getting bits and pieces and reading between the lines here, but apparently he is now sitting under the phase one teaching, and so pray for his salvation. God will continue to work there. There's also six families working among the Anim language. They're trying very hard to find a place to locate. Again, there's a very small but vocal opposition, uh, keeping them out of the main group of the Anim people where your language and culture learning conditions are most ideal. The Anim language is, is very, very different than the Lucy language. There will be a need for a Western couple to go in there and do what we are doing to help them with the translation work like we are helping in the Lucy work. So there is a couple on the field right now. They just went in August. They're still in their orientation and their preparation things. They still, we talked to them, to them by Skype the other evening. They're still very interested in participating alongside of the Moak missionary co-workers. Continue to keep them in their prayers. This is a new thing uh, uh, for new tribes to be doing this sort of thing. And so they're sort of feeling their way along and looking at what we've done and trying to determine what to do. So please keep them in your prayers. Finally, our six Moat co-workers continue this year to have outreaches in at least two different Lucy villages. Um, our partner Kakus is hopefully writing the Bible lessons for Romans so that we can teach them when we go back next year. Keep them in your prayers for their health, for their safety. There is a massive drought going on in Papua New Guinea right now. All over the country, our coworkers are very much affected by it. They are eating starvation food. That means they're out in the jungle digging up roots and hunting for whatever they can scavenge to eat. Okay, it is so dry there that the jungle is burning. Okay, it is the front end of the El Nino effect. You guys will get it next year, but the front end of it is, is that there's drought in Papua New Guinea. So pray for them. They need rain. They need rain desperately because it doesn't only affect their gardens this year. It affects how, what they plant next year, if they have anything left to plant this coming year. So pray for them, pray for the young Lucy Christians as they face opposition and persecution, but that their light would shine and that God would continue to uh, reach this people group and bring them out of the darkness of the animism and the, false Western, the bondage of the false Western religion that they're under, that God in his own time, using ordinary people, will continue to shine the light of truth into the hearts and minds of the Lucy people. 
Uh, please praise God with us for his grace and his mighty works. I leave you this morning with uh, some singing in Lucy, uh, and hopefully it will bless your heart. So thank you for the opportunity this morning, and God bless you. Bye.